Who should we be in this world? Mary or Martha? That's what we're going to talk about today. All over the world, people go to unimaginable lengths to find God, which is sad when you consider the unimaginable lengths God has already gone to find us. Joanna Weaver, Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World. Today we're going to talk about the book, Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World, Finding Intimacy with God in the Busyness of Life. Now, I'll tell you the truth of it is that I find it harder to do book reviews on this podcast of books I love. And this is one of them. I loved this book because I don't know how to stop talking about the heart and the ideas and the thoughts going into this. To be honest with you, I'm not a Martha. You listen to half of the religious podcasts out there, half of the sermons that are about Mary and Martha, and everyone will say, well, we all know you're a Martha. You're busy. That. You're trying to get things done, finish projects, but it was Mary that Jesus said was doing the right thing. How can we be more like Mary? I have to tell you the truth. I am more like Mary, maybe not in the way Mary was, because if you had a great speaker in my house, I would not be the person in the kitchen cooking dinner, finding cookies, getting drinks for everybody. I would be the one glued to the person in my living room trying to figure out what they're talking about. I'm not a very Martha person, to be honest with you. That's what my whole Start With Small Steps podcast is about, that I have come through a thing and learned how to be productive, get my goals while having that merry heart. (laughs) This book is interesting to me, and I was interested in how it was going to go about telling us what to do. I, after reading this book, loved it. I just loved so many things about it. But she makes the point that we're busy. We're all really busy. But she also describes of what the life of 1884, an American farmer, noted that his wife was patient and overworked. And someone in the 1900s wrote a schedule of what it's like to be the farm life. And it was getting up at four in the morning, starting the fire, sweeping the floor. I'll go go through the things. But a ton of work all day long. Someone once asked the question that if Little House on the Prairie, Laura Engel Wilder, saw our lives today, what would she be most impressed with? The computers, the cars, the airplane? And someone said, no, the vast amount of free time we have. So we're actually a lot better in our world than it used to be. But still, somehow, we get overworked. We get buried under things to do. God calls us to learn more about him, to be his disciples to do the things he says to do, which we can only do if we know what they are. We are kind of stuck in a Martha world of busyness when Mary is sitting at the feet of her Lord, listening to the words he says. And she said she finds herself cheering for Martha, that we all go, well, what did she do wrong? She was busy making sure everyone was happy and fed and had drinks and everything was perfect. A lot of people who are perfectionists feel overwhelmed with tasks, even not even that far, just want to take care of the people around them. That is how they feel. They just feel very overwhelmed. And so the story, she says, in Luke starts out with, and we're in Luke right now in the Bible in small steps, how Jesus comes to her house. And this is going to be the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know that they were probably well-to-do. But as soon as the Messiah comes to Martha's house, what does she do? You know, she's going to be the person who makes the perfect meal, gets to make sure that everyone has what they want to drink, making everything so comfortable. Martha is going to make everything perfect. When she went to Jesus and talked to him about Mary, who's not helping her, I get the idea that if Mary would help Martha, they would have been able to split the work and maybe each of them We get to get time to listen to him, listen to Jesus. But what Jesus is saying is different. And I think she did not get the response she was looking for because he said, oh, Martha, you know, in this voice. And and says, Mary has picked the better way. We could go without a meal. In fact, this is Jesus. He could like conjure up some fish and and, uh, bread in any amount of quantity you want, probably some wine in there too. 
the important part is Jesus is not going to be on this planet for very long. In fact, I added up the days and it's 1,277-ish days. Time with Jesus is something that almost every person on this planet, many people, would want. We would all want to spend a meal with Jesus so we could talk to him, so we could figure out his heart, so we could see what kind of man he is, so we could hear about what the kingdom of God is. This is a Messiah coming to your house. We would all probably just do anything to get him in our house. But then once we had him in our house, would we do housework? Would we cook and clean? Mary, she's the person who wants to sit at his feet. I bet you Jesus knows the heart. He knows what's going on in Martha's heart. He knows what's going on in Mary's heart. He understands people before they understand themselves. And so he knew at one point she was just going to get exasperated. I mean, how exasperated do you have to be to go tattle on your sister to the Messiah of the world? That's pretty frustrated. But he knew it was coming and he knew what to say. This book points out, too, that later in the Gospels, we'll see a brand new Martha, one who actually puts her faith in Jesus, that she has calmed it down. And now she has the, what the faith in Jesus that Joanna says only comes from spending time at Jesus' feet. But she points out, too, that Mary changed a little bit as well, that Mary, when Lazarus dies, she was sorrowful. She didn't even come out to greet Jesus. And so Joanna, the author, says, that's what I see in this biblical portrait of the two sisters of Bethany. Two completely different women undergo a transformation right before our eyes, a holy transformation. The bold one comes meek, and the mild one, courageous. It is impossible to be in the presence of Jesus and not be changed. And that's really the goal of all of us. If we wonder, where's our change? Where's our change of heart? How come our lives are not improving? How come we are not closer to avoiding the sins we have in our life? Are we sitting at the feet of Jesus? I think that in the end is what this book is about. How can we do better for that? And like I said, loved this book. I absolutely love this book. I recommend it to anybody who wants a fresh perspective on two kinds of people and, and how they approach Jesus and what it did for them. And of course, the next line that Jesus says, says it all. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. One thing. That is going to be sitting at the feet, having a discipleship relationship with Jesus, being his follower. Only one thing is needed. And Jesus asks us all the time throughout the Bible to spend time with him, to pray with him, to drink the everlasting water. This is where it's important. And so in this book, it makes this interesting analogy between the living room where you have that close tie with Jesus to the kitchen where it's busy work, things to do, things to get done. I get it. I have a kitchen too, and I have work to do, and I have things I have to get done. But spending that time in that living room with Jesus is so important. And how many times do we take time to do it? She also brings up the point, and this is really interesting, that Martha says to Jesus, don't you care? Wow. She is frustrated to the point to ask the Messiah, don't you care? And of course he does. But that's what happens, Joanna says, when we get so frustrated, we don't know what else to say, right? I am so upset right now. I don't even think you care about what's going on with me. It's such a statement. And like I said, and she says it gets wrapped up into perfectionism, that we feel like we can't do enough or we can't do it well enough. I get it too. Like, can't you imagine half the people out there that they have Je Jesus in their living room? I have to make the perfect meal. I have to set up the perfect wine. I, you know, thinking this is the most important person I'm ever going to have in my house. This needs to be perfect. It's not true. It's not what Jesus is looking at. And that is where she said that the problem with all of this is we get distracted, discouraged, and we start having doubts. And Satan, he knows how to hone right in on all of those things instead of the faith, the happiness. Satan knows how to just drive that wedge into our heart. Why I can't have my house be like this or I can't have this meal be like that when Jesus is here. And in the end, the author says, Martha is distracted. It's possible too. 
Satan knows how to directly get to each and every one of us, right? He knows our weaknesses. I always said that, you know, sin and Satan is kind of like pushing a swing. You don't push against the swing, you push with the swing. That's how you get someone to go in a direction you want them to go. You help them go into the direction they're already going. And in this case, Martha's feeling of overwhelm and busyness and distractedness, Satan pushes her right into that. But Jesus, again, knows the perfect thing to say and how to intervene, how to talk to Martha in the right way. She even gives the King James Version of this chapter where it says, Martha was cumbered about much serving. (laughs) That's a good way of saying it. Boy, don't you just love King James? And to be occupied, to be focused on everything else except that you have the Messiah of the world in your living room and that he is speaking to you. He is talking to you. You can ask him questions. That's the amazing part of it. And Luke captures this whole story. And I believe out of all the encounters Jesus had with people, this is obviously the one I think that resonates the most with a lot of people because We all feel too busy to do that. I mean, I know men. I have to work. I have to provide for my family, couples who own businesses. We have to get all these things done. I have a job and I have these podcasts. I'm busy, 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 right? But when are we spending time sitting at the feet of our Lord? We all feel this way. This story, no matter who you are, whether you're Mary or Martha or Bob and Sam, gets to your heart. We get distracted with the busyness of our lives and don't sit at the feet of our Lord. Now, at that time, they didn't have a written scripture. They had a written Old Testament and the books of the law and the prophets. But now we have the words of Jesus with us. So we can put in our pockets, stick in our phones, Jesus with us all the time so that we can sit at his feet and listen to his words anytime, everywhere. It is an absolute gift. I mean, it'd be cooler if he was in our living room, right? But instead, we got to spend time doing that. We have to set aside time doing that, keeping ourselves from being distracted, bombarded with things. I did a podcast and start with Small Step about how to cut things out of our lives so we have time for the things that matter the most. That's what this book is really talking about, is that when we're feeling discouraged, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling upset, We can have, she says, you know, the self-pity break down on us. We can feel anger. Maybe Martha's emotions and all of this was the fact that she was getting overwhelmed. But instead, what we should be doing is realigning our tasks, realigning our goals, realigning all the things we have to do so they all point to God immediately. That's what brings us into that relationship with Jesus is when we become aligned to him, we will be able to connect with him too. And we start learning to hear his voice. We start knowing what he wants from us, but we also start learning what he can offer us. In the book itself, and like I said, I'm just reviewing this and going over it. She gives some practical advice about how you can get back in line. How can you allow yourself to stop being so discouraged? How you can stop feeling so overwhelmed? And there's really good piece of advice in here about that. And then she talks about that part where Martha's frustrated and says, God, don't you even care? I think that we get to that point of exasperation. We wonder, does God even care? Do we forget his goodness, his love, his mercy, his perfect justice, his perfect forgiveness? Or do we start feeling, he doesn't know me, he doesn't understand me, he is not getting what I'm trying to go at, and we get discouraged in all of this. And this is where I thought was an interesting point in the book, where she brings in Judas. Judas got that discouragement. He had a plan. Judas knew what he wanted Jesus to do. And we don't know exactly what was going on in the mind of Judas when he was talking about it, but it was probably that they wanted to throw out the Romans, that a lot of people feel that was part of what needed to happen in Judas's mind, that we had to stand up and take the Israel nation back and make it like what King David had. And then he had this image of who Jesus was. And when he looked at Jesus and Jesus kept saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, I'm going to come back, I'm going to forgive sins. And maybe Judas saw all the times where Jesus was spending time 
in these small towns, these small synagogues speaking to people and wondering, why aren't we going to Jerusalem and taking down this Roman government, taking down this temple structure that's keeping Roman power? And then I think when he saw Jesus determined to go to Jerusalem and die, he had it. That was the end. And he was just going to take what money he could get from the situation and end it. I always sort of wondered, too, was he trying to create a confrontation between the Romans, the temple structure, and Jesus, knowing that Jesus had the power to break out of whatever trap was set for him. So his discouragement took over. His disappointment in Jesus, Jesus, don't you even care? Took him down the wrong track. But instead, Martha went on the right track. She went from being angry at her sister, thinking she was right, wondering if Jesus even cared, and then instead turned her trust towards Jesus. She got back on the right track again. Instead of letting her doubt get worse, take over her life, her fears, all the things that she said, instead, she brought herself in line with Jesus. She ended up having a better relationship with Jesus after that point, and she knew it. And we'll hear, and later on, Martha is the one that goes to Jesus to talk about Lazarus, Lazarus being dead. And I know anxiety is hard for people. I know people who are anxious. It overwhelms people with worry and what's going to happen next and the unknown. And Jesus is telling us to put all our baskets in him. You know, we just got done with this part of Luke where Jesus was saying, your family shouldn't be above your Lord. Your money should not be above your Lord. The focus should always be on God as the number one slot in your life over everything. And when it comes to our anxiety, our worry, we have to put those in line too, because in that same chapter, he says, don't worry. Do not fear. Don't have anxiety. He doesn't want us to live that life of fear. He wants us to bring everything to him. And he incorporates us into his miracles. But he is the good father who gives his children what they need. And so the author of this book wants us to understand that if we're anxious, there's a good side and a bad side, right? Concern is good. It Make sure that we're focused on something that's true. We address problems. We try to solve problems. When you can put everything into God, because worry, she says, is unfounded, is generalized. You sometimes can't even pick out the right things. It can cause obsessions, and it can even create more problems. Worry, I think, is one of the number one health problems in our world because it causes so many downsides to our health. And Jesus says, I have overcome the world. You know, when we have Jesus as our Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, the person who created this planet and created us and knows our owner manuals, knows our thoughts, when we have God on our side, who can be against us? We may go through things that we don't like to go through, but he promises us he's going to equip us to get over those things. So. If we can change our worry into instead something like concern, keeping your eyeball on, creating plans for, praying for. I mean, there's the number one thing right there. Praying for these things, we're going to be in better shape. And she quotes Paul in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which is, of course, everybody's favorite thing when you're an anxious person. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, With thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That passage right there, for people who are worried, you could put them on a card, and anytime you feel worried, you reread it, and you realign yourself with that vision of God. So the author says that we should say that instead of worrying, we should pray. Instead of being anxious about things, we should turn them into prayers. And she said it may even sound too simple, but that's what God asks us to do. And if we do those things, 
and we ask God specifically to release anxiety from us, release that worry from us, instead of what she calls fretting, magnifying the problem, instead, prayer magnifies God. And then being grateful, thanking God before whatever it is is even delivered to us. We want to always be thankful for maybe not what circumstance we're in. You know, you always hear people say that like they get a very bad illness. And am I supposed to be thanking God for this? No, but you're going to be thankful for God for protecting us, for keeping us strong, for letting us go on. And in the end, too, the kingdom of everlasting life, that is where the reward is. That's where we're going to go. And so we can get rid of worry and instead move on with God and pray to him and have him give us that strength. I always, I think, personally found something that I kept forgetting about prayer is that you'll say something like, you know that you should do something. God says these are some specific things you should do, and you don't feel like doing them. And so then you pray and say, well, God, I should be doing these things. Help me do these things. And you still don't feel like doing them. Maybe what you should be doing is praying more upstream of that and saying, God, give me the heart that wants to do what you have asked me to do. You can go further upstream and cut this negative feeling off at the pass. That's what you're really trying to do. So we're going to go ahead and end it there. We're going to talk about this book next week. Like I said, I love this book. I think it's fantastic. And if you want a really good, I don't know, book on how we should reorder our brains to be, first of all, between this Mary and Martha world, but then to take on some of the aspects that Martha had and turning them into something more positive. That's what we're going to talk about next week. So my challenge to you is, can you think about one thing where you can't give it up? It's maybe a piece of busy work. It's something that's very time consuming. And maybe it's something that does not have to be done. Is there a different way you can go about either having your kids help or asking a friend for help? Or maybe just giving up on this thing entirely because it is just not that important. And find some extra time to spend with God in his word, in prayer, meditation, filling ourselves up with God. Let's just try it with one small thing and see how that works out for us. Sometimes I find that when you do that, the solution to the other problem comes a little bit more apparent or maybe some way to do it better. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that I have other podcasts and you can look at a better life in small steps.com to see what my other podcasts are. And remember, our walk to becoming more like Mary starts with small steps. <laughs>